All right, thank you everyone. I'm somewhere the internet's a bit um, unstable, so I'm going to keep my video off. I'm sorry about that. I think we'll get straight into it. And we have our first presenter, which is Palessa Kadi from UCT, and she's dealing with the demise of the Red Location Cultural Precinct, a glance into public memory, which public, whose memory? Palessa, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I, would, I would like to first pl uh, play the trailer of work and then further explain myself Thank through you. a presentation. Please play the presentation. In the early 90s, the concept of transforming red location came through a promise for the greater development of the place using a public memory narrative of a museum. A massive structure heralding transformation, freedom and prosperity was developed by the municipality. This was meant to be realized through tourism. In my introduction, I use Zwaim Kijima's visual depiction of the demise of Red Location Museum. Zwaim is a new Brighton thespian, a shining star trained by the late Winston Jonah, the Tony Award winner who worked with John Kang and Arthur Fugert. In transcribing the spatial history of New Brighton, the use of wolf neuroarchitect images is meant to be thought provoking. I opted for a visual presentation as there is no amount, no description that can better illustrate the current state of red location cultural precinct. Man built places of healing, heritage structures, legacy. How many stones can destroy a structure? When art is silent, the wicked takes over. Society crumbles. Society construct these Gothic sites. Who, who can save us? Has our African God stopped listening to his people? Or has he stopped talking to us? Thank you very much. Can we then go to, to the paper now? Uh, yes, please, Palisa. Oh, I th oh, okay. I thought you were just going to uh, um, uh, share it. I can continue. Yes, please. From my side. Um, all right. Thank you very much, um, colleagues. I'm presenting about a multi-million cultural precinct in red location uh, in former Port Elizabeth, uh, renamed um, Rebecca in, in South Africa, uh, Eastern Cape province. I'm sure you have seen and went through this short trailer and I've managed to capture your, um, some sentiments about where modern heritage, if it is, where and how it's evolved among communities and what is the current status of this particular one. But also um, you have seen how Zwai uh, Kijima was the narrator, uh, his, when he was crawling in and out of the museum and how then people access the museum um, today and, and, and onwards. Um, mine also is to say that the municipality or any government officials, they are banned from entering this infrastructure. Um, there's a community impasse as we, we are talking right now, um, discussing futures. Um, mine also is to attempt to give a perspective of the Red Location Cultural Precinct's uh, closure and what this means to residents, what this means to municipality, um, 
as, as government, but also to heritage practitioners like myself. Another issue that I'm bringing forth through this presentation is how should architects um, think about the end of life of a building, the ruins, closure, crisis, or worst case scenarios like these. Uh, it also a reflection for many, especially in the space of design and, and heritage on for them to start looking into a focus on the limitation of architecture in planning for the unknown. Um, with this huge um, development presented as a tourist um, attraction, presented as a pillar of hope in a poverty stricken place, uh, no one ever anticipated that the museum infrastructure built in the same location where people suffered and endured a lot of struggles. Uh, it will take the same community to close it down. In 2013, the slogan, no housing, no museum, was accompanied by a service delivery protest. Uh, this was in the, in the area of New Brighton, red location, it's called Ilali Ebomv. Um, this is South Africa's, um, one of South Africa's oldest cities, um, Port Elizabeth, with quite a number of areas um, deemed as township townships, and they have quite a number of um, housing schemes as well. Part of this also the area, if you could have um, seen that there were corrugated iron houses in Inside the museum is part of design, but also the this was how the setup was, and how people lived um, prior to to the establishment of the museum. So this was a 1900 Boer concentration camp, uh, which was um, re-established re uh, in this particular area. But post 1994 we had promises from a new democratic government. And one of them was decent housing for all. As you see the current impasse, um, the cessation of this cultural precinct um, where no outsiders may enter. I regard myself as an insider and an outsider because I was born in that particular area in red location. But decent housing for all, the promise of, 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 of decent housing uh, led to this impasse. All the requirements were from the community side was that we require a 48 square meter um, house design uh, made of bricks as we move uh, we promised decent housing. And the current government policy is a 40, it's a 40 square meter um, housing uh, building, um, which now the difference is almost eight square meters um, and the, the, both the government and the community are struggling to reach some form of um, consensus. But I understand there are negotiations coming forth uh, through one of my colleagues, um, uh, Budaza. But this is also a place that is very significant historically it's the place of the defiance campaign, which started in 1952. This is the very first um, initiation uh, point um, in South African politics, um, where some of the locals, including the late Raymond Shaba, walked in the European only side in the railway station uh, in New Brighton. This also then was carried by major other boy boycotts that carried through this place as a place of a people's struggle. This is a national site of struggle, as also said by Nero uh, Wolf architects. And their depiction of the place tried um, to replicate the life that people lived. This was opened in 2006 and in 2013 closed because of the said um, impasse. But also mine is to debate the connotation of public. Which public are we referring to? And whose memory we, 
often, very often um, intend to document. Are these part of the people building or deconstructing the museum? And who said the museum will carry their memory forth? And which and what is this public that we are referring to as custodians of the history of place and how South Africa and its politics continue to strive? I'm including politics here deliberately because the community is also divided. But the loud and the loudest um, part of community leaders that close the museums are the ones without the 48 square meter um, houses that were promised um, to them. But also they continue to be dissatisfied by the quality of housing uh, provided to them. I'm also looking into this structure in particular, its size, and also looking at other urbanization, cultural institutions, like township museums in, in, in Luanje, in uh, Hector Peterson in Soweto, in Johannesburg, and how the notion of Prisingwood continues to live by and extends um, the neighborhood and the neighborliness, saying that then, all the structures established should find a way of living um, as museums themselves, but also communities should partake in forming a very a significant part of, of that museum, be it the neighborliness element of walking down the street and showing everyone up and telling everyone about the narrative of place. But the narrative of poverty continues to exist alongside these structures. This is the current state in red location and continues um, to, to live uh, in, 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 in that. Uh, we've spoken about social maintenance uh, with my colleagues from, from, from the UP cohort, University of Pretoria. We, we said that, but then what becomes of a structure and when does the architect, the designer leave the structure? How do people continue to be part of owning um, these entities, these buildings that we have seen over time in South Africa post 1994? And how then the impasse continues to affect those who were deemed to be um, re recipients um, of this heritage? And who are the owners of this heritage? I'm asking more questions than having answers because it has taken the longest time to come to a resolve for this place and not a lot of discussion in South Africa around this. But some elements begin to speak directly to what is envisaged to be the best for communities and what people living in those areas that we deem to be custodians believe is what their heritage. So heritage is contested, but buildings are even more contested. Uh, this is the story of red location. I have also included the map um, in page three of my, pay, of, my, of my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope I have not taken a lot of time, but we'll be happy to engage further. Thank you, Palisa. Um, I must apologize. I said Palisa was from University of Cape Town, but she's actually a doctoral candidate in the research chair, in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Pretoria. So um, perhaps it would be good if we could go through all of our speakers and then have questions, um, take questions at the end. Um, hello. So our next speaker is, um, it's a joint paper, but it's going to be presented by Kukua. Uh, I'm afraid I can't really say your surname properly, uh, Manfule, uh, who will be talking to the paper. She's an architect and PhD candidate at SO 
AS, University of London, and her research deals with the architecture of schooling in Ghana. Kukua, would you like to start your presentation? Just check in, you can see my screen okay. Yes, yes we can, and thank you. Okay. Um, so, greetings, everybody. Sorry, Sorry can you make your, uh, um, put it in presenter view so that it's full screen? There we yes, go. I there we go. Was. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, yeah. Um, so greetings everyone who's at this session. Um, this is a presentation titled Ambivalence and African Modernity in State Buildings. And it's based on a paper by Prof. Julia Galaha, Innocent Nube, and Kukwaman for myself from the African State Architecture Project at SOAS University of London. Um, so the early post-colonial state was often pitched as a project of modernity. Um, Kwame Nkrumah, for instance, the first president of Ghana, spoke of the new Ghanaian state vision to reconsider African society in such a manner that the humanism of traditional African life reassets itself in a modern technical community. But it's essential to note that the African modernities envisaged here meant not traditional, both in a conventional Western sense of modernity, but also in an anti-colonial sense. Nkrumah expresses it in his 1967 text, African Socialism Revisited, when he says that Islamic civilization and European colonialism are both historical experiences of the traditional African society. Modern African societies are not traditional, even if backward, end quotes. But in reality, the manifestation of modernity through post-colonial state building was ambiguous. The post-colonial modernity was desirable as part of the 1960s African agendas of catching up with the rest of the developed world, but also criticized in some cases as a continuation of the colonial projects. Projects aiming towards architectural and infrastructural modernity have been realized in different ways. Some early post-colonial architecture projects often opted for high modernism, appearing to fit more closely with modernity as not traditional approach. For example, as seen in the development of the new town of Lilongwe in Malawi as a post-colonial capital city. The master planning had strict spatial zoning, land use segregation, and a non-mixing of users approach that attempted to depart from what was seen as a traditional and cultural settlement and urban use patterns in the old Lilongwe town, pre-colonial old Lilongwe town. Some more recent state architecture projects in various African locations have explored more of a modernity as not colonial approach drawing on vernacular forms, cultural symbols, and traditional ideas to express the state. This presentation looks at how such African modernities have been envisaged and expressed in three recent prestigious architectural projects in Ghana, Malawi, and South Africa. We look at the buildings themselves, what they were intended to represent, and how they are being received. We ask, how is modernity expressed and read in these projects? What does modernity mean here? And what does it mean to different groups? The first building is Ghana's Jubilee House, which is the presidential palace. Ghana's presidential palace was built to symbolize breaks with the colonial past by exiting the Christiansburg castle, which until then had been used as the seat of government, while at the same time maintaining links to pre-colonial traditional symbols of authority by infusing traditional symbolism through the use of Akan, an ethnic group, symbols and royal motifs. The building was designed and constructed in the beginning as a gift from India to Ghana. The building's form evokes the symbol of an Akan royal school, stool, which is a traditional cultural symbol. The design becomes an amalgamation of a constructed national tradition centered on Akan culture on one hand, and on the other hand, an external projection of a global modernity. While a significant proportion of Ghanaians surveyed concerning the presidential palace had an affinity to the royal symbolo symbology 
and appreciated the perceived inaccessibility and aloofness of the building. Not everyone could or wanted to relate to the symbolism of the Akan Royals too. The symbology of the presidential palace then continues in the spirit of Kwame Nkrumah, the first president, relying heavily on Akan, Asante and particular symbols. As one responded pointed out, where he was from in the Upper East region of Ghana, the chiefs there, they sit on skins and not stools. The second building is Malawi's new parliament. The new parliament of Malawi was commissioned in May 2010 and is located within the Lilongwe city center. Elites involved in this design intended the building to portray Malawian culture. The centerpiece of this plan was a dome which was depicted as an inverted calabash, a pot or a granary. The dome was designed to represent Malawian hospitality, food sufficiency, and communal values. A consortium of Malawian architects was selected to design the building, and they were directly briefed by the president of state of the state, Bengu Wa Mutharika, on the type of parliament building they were supposed to design. They also contact, conducted tours to other parliaments in Africa to look at other precedents. The building project was initially funded through development aid from Taiwan, but was then taken over by the People's Republic of China at the commencement of Malawi-China diplomatic relations in 2008. Although ordinary people in Ilongwe were positively disposed towards the building because in quotes, it has beautified the city, they do not relate with the elite projection of parliament being symbolic of indigenous Malawian tradition. In particular, they only see the dome as some sort of technology that has nothing to do with Malawian culture or tradition. They also consider the role that China played in the construction of the building to be against the elite intentions of domesticating the building. The third building is South Africa's Northern Cape Legislature. The Northern Cape Legislature in South Africa was a new parliament opened in 2003, designed to bring democracy closer to black South Africans who had been excluded under colonialism and apartheid. The building was meant to embody a locally rooted relatable parliament. The Northern Cape Legislature building was located in Halishewe, a township outside Kimberley. Its forms, colors and finishes were designed to describe vernacular shapes curves, rough finishes, and earthy colors. For example, the core structure is a conical shape representing a bullhorn, the instrument traditionally used to call people to political meetings. And it is surrounded by an open space for the community to be able to engage in political processes. Parts of the building resonated with local people, those that made references to the anti-apartheid struggle. The depiction of local heroes were particularly pleasing. But the aesthetic parts that were meant to reference African ideas and symbols were less successful. The bullhorn, for example, was referenced, was likened to, in quotes, a giant lipstick or the chimney of a steamship, like Van Riebeck's original Cape Town Parliament, but better, in quotes. In conclusion, the presentations of African modernities through the architecture of grand state buildings are largely an elite interest in Ghana, Malawi, and South Africa. In all three cases, the projections of African modernity through um, architecture has been through an attempt at channeling traditional symbolism through a global modern architectural language. And as we've seen, these have not landed exactly as intended. Thank you. It appears that we have lost Philippa, unfortunately. I see she um, is not in the room anymore. And we have her back. I know that she's having some connectivity issues. Philippa, can you hear us again? Yeah. 
Philippa, can you unmute and see if um, you are back? Doesn't seem like it. Um, but there we go, Philippa. Yes, thank you. Hi, Jacques. Sorry about that. I'm ah, having uh, some serious connectivity mm -hmm. issues. I don't um, know why. Yes, I am. Kuku, are you, are you, I'm guessing you finished your presentation. Yes, I have. Thank you very much for that. And I really apologize. I'm going to, I'm trying to fix it on my side. Hopefully it will get fixed. Uh, and then I'd just like to invite Patricia, who's our next presenter, and she'll be talking about modern architecture in Mozambique as a palimpest of reappropriation. Patricia? Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Good morning. Um, getting there? There we go. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> good morning, once again. My name is uh, Patricia Normomed. I am a PhD candidate um, at Universidade Politécnica in Madrid and a lecturer at Universidade de VTV in Mozambique. The paper that I am presenting today is entitled Reading Modern Architecture in Mozambique as a Palimpsest of Reappropriations. To talk about this, I will begin with a brief introduction on the state of the question um, around the subject of modern architecture in Mozambique. Then um, I will explain the reasons why I consider essential to adapt um, to adopt a new methodological approach around this issue, an approach based on a diachronic reading of uh, this legacy. Uh, from there, I will focus on the study of a paradigmatic case of Mozambican, of late Mozambican modernity, the Torres Vermelhas complex in Maputo, to demonstrate the potentialities of this uh, new reading and finally, I will draw a series of conclusions that I will hope it will contribute to, to the discussion that is being held on this symposium. On the subject of uh, modern architecture in Mozambique, there are already several publications like the ones that we can see in this slide. And from these publications, we know today that the cycle of uh, modernity took place within the affirmation framework of the um, Portuguese colonial imperialism under the political regime of the Estado Novo. And during this period, the Mozambican territory witnessed a strong urban expansion that transformed and consolidated the appearance of its main cities due to the implementation of an architecture grounded on the principles of the modern movement. On this knowledge base, specialized literature has managed to review important references on Mozambican uh, modernity, references like the ones we see here. And yet, despite the value attributed by this investigation to this architectural production, nowadays neither the local authorities nor the populations themselves identify this building as an integral part of their cultural heritage. From my point of view, this is due to the way in which the theme of modernity in Mozambique has been approached in general by most researchers on the subject. These studies had tended to treat the, the history of Mozambique's modern architecture as a close chapter in the history of Portuguese architecture of the 20th century by linking its final development with the end of Mozambique colonization in 1975. However, I believe that this approach does not allow the development of this architecture to be contextualized in all its complexities. This is why I propose in opposition to these uh, partial readings of Mozambique's modernity, a diachronic reading of this legacy. Because the truth is that if Mozambique went through a process of transition from colonialism to independence, with radical transformations uh, at the political, social, cultural, and economic level, this process must also have had some effects on its modern legacy. Effect that needs to be studied and understand in order to reassess the cultural meanings of this architecture. For these reasons, I suggest to take the independence of Mozambique, not as the end in, of its modern uh, architectural production, as most researchers on the subject have done, but as the beginning of its heritage construction. 
And I propose this because when Mozambique achieved independence, the massive exodus of the population of European origin left a large number of abandoned buildings within the urban center of the country's main cities, which were later occupied by a part of the native population formerly restricted to the suburbs. This new occupation- We see uh, an impact. Uh, l'appropriation des bâtiments, et, 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 et le leg historique est aussi étudié. Pour montrer l'importance de cette lecture diachronique, j'ai étudié le cas de la architecture moderne de ce complexe Torres Vermelhas qui est situé à Maputo après la dépendance du pays. Donc, euh, le complexe a été, a été démoli et, et les bâtiments qui sont, vous voyez ici, euh, Torres Vermeja, ça a été édifié en 1998. C'est un cas intéressant euh, de ce qui s'est passé ici parce que c'est la combinaison euh, des aspects toniques et, et de, dans ces aspects techniques de la modernité euh, portugaise et qui a été finalement achevée euh, quelques années plus tard. D'autres bâtiments que, que j'ai euh, examinés, ce sont les euh, designs originels de centres de maisons à Maputo, de centres commerciaux. Donc voilà le projet original de Torres Vermelias, euh, qui, qui a été, ça, ce sont des esquisses de 2003 euh, pour euh, des complexes qui ont été édifiés pour euh, l'hébergement. Euh, donc, euh, il y a plusieurs éléments en jeu. Euh, vous voyez, il y a, il y a une différente euh, conception de l'habitation ici. Euh, il, y a la, il y a l'entrée, il y a la, les différentes chambres, la véranda. Donc, l'arrangement, la conception des appartements euh, 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 sont spécifiques. Et c'est un appartement pour une organisation tripartite d'un habitat bourgeois. L'appartement la, euh, devait couvrir 200 mètres carrés, donc c'est un appartement bourgeois d'une taille assez impressionnante. Et, euh, donc, vous avez euh, les différents projets originaux du 14e et du 15e et du 18e, 18e étage. Et vous voyez la complexité. Et, euh, il y avait vraiment une centaine d'habitations dans ce contexte. Je crois qu'il n'y en avait plus, que, plus de 500. Donc, vous avez ici la, euh, la première tour qui a été construite à Maputo dans ce style, euh, style d'architecture. Donc, ces constructions sont restées euh, non terminées, non achevées après l'indépendance. Il y avait une commission en place euh, et cette commission avait pour but d'essayer de terminer tout, euh, d'achever tous les bâtiments qui étaient laissés euh, non achevés. Euh, il y a un projet très onéreux d'altération, de, de modification a été mis en place. Euh, à cette époque, euh, le gouvernement après l'indépendance avait beaucoup de déficits et euh, à essayer euh, de, euh, de faire le maximum avec, 
euh, avec ce qui restait pour essayer de les modifier, pour accroître le nombre d'habitations, euh, l'hébergement possible, d'habitations possibles. Euh, L'idée, c'était de retransformer la configuration initiale. Euh, il y a 164 appartements dans, à chaque étage maintenant. Il euh, y a eu des appartements aussi qui ont été construits avec deux, trois chambres. Donc, c'est un complexe d'habitation, la Torre Vermeillas, de, qui date de, de 1996, euh, qui montre le style euh, moderne de l'époque. Et une fois que les projets ont été terminés dans les années euh, euh, à la fin du 19e, du 20e siècle, et c'est la Banque du Mozambique qui a contribué. Donc maintenant, vous voyez maintenant la Torres Omelias, à quoi elle ressemble de nos jours. Mozambique was completely enclosed on the ground floor, uh, limiting any type of connection between the two towers. And on the other hand, given the greater economic capacity of this institution, uh, capacity to carry out um, the maintenance of the building, the tower is in much better shape than the other one, as we can see here. In addition, more, many of the inhabitants who, who came to live to the, to the state tower, not the Bank of Mozambique Tower, uh, no longer belong to, the, to that more modest social class for which the amendment project was made. That is why the minimal configuration of the apartments doesn't adapt so well to the current way of living. This has made that little but little, each, um, each one has individually been modifying and transforming their apartments to express the new, their new social, um, socioeconomic condition. Just uh, a few remarks to conclude. Through this uh, analysis, I have tried to relocate the Torres Remedias complex in its specific framework of changes and transformations and the term the links establish it not only with the society that conceived it, the colonial one, but also with the different users who have uh, occupied and inhabited it later during the post-colonial period. By doing so, it has been possible to see how the Torres Remedios project cannot read as a single project, the one developed uh, exclusive in the colonial period, but in reality is a shared project carried out between its original authors and the most diverse agents from the public authorities and the regulations which promoted the alteration project, the new team of Bulgarian designers who transformed in the first phase um, the interior of the buildings and the residents themselves who continue to successfully adapt the space to their needs. This appropriations process uh, thus seems to indicate that post-colonial Mozambican society has already intuitively assumed this legacy as part of its collective memory. And furthermore, with their various interventions, the inhabitants have already begun to write their own narratives around this legacy. Hence, the need to understand the temporal evolution of modern architecture in Mozambique by collecting these different narratives as a way of providing better arguments for the, to the critical evaluation of this legacy as cultural heritage. Perhaps in this way, public authorities and local societies may begin to recognize this legacy as an inherent part of the collective memory, finding the reasons to care for it and transmit it. Thank you for your time. Or was this a he and Sato Mozambique Kaninabo? Uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, my name is Tamar Belanda, and I'm going to take over from Philippa chairing this session. Unfortunately, uh, she's experiencing internet connections, and, and, and hence I'm stepping in. Uh, but I'd really like to, to thank you and the other presenters for these uh, thought-provoking um, presentations that, that speak to the wider theme of heritage and, and particularly the notions of who does it belong to and, and how does one share uh, uh, it? I think uh, we have uh, uh, some time 
to to organize some some form of discussion. Um, and I would like to invite the presenters to perhaps if they are able to turn their cameras on so that then we can take some questions from from the audience. Um, and if not, I can start uh, maybe uh, an attempt at connecting some dots between the 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 talks, but I'm, I'm wondering yeah, if there's anyone uh, in the audience who would like to pose any direct questions first. We seem to have a fairly uh, silent audience, uh, <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to try and, and give it a go myself. But at, at sketching, uh, perhaps some 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 points of connection between the presentations. I think they were really really valuable, and uh, um, I think in in many ways. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Kuku's uh, uh, work. I mean, you locate your your research within the larger research project. I think at SOAS about African state architecture, if I'm correct. And 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 one of the things that 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 I find intriguing is the representation of 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 power through the the actual built form. And I think that speaks in many ways both to Patricia's uh, point on appropriation and reappropriation and to Palais's sketching of you know what has been the impact of the red location uh, museum within a context which was looking for something else and so again what is really then the power and the agency of both the architect but then um, in terms of what are we trying to consider a monument or money and, and value as heritage. So I don't know if maybe on the notion of power, you are willing to sketch a little bit broad, broadly the, the, the larger sort of like um, thread of that African state architecture um, idea. And, and then we can ask Valesa and Patricia if they are willing to you know, uh, join into that. Um. Yeah, so just briefly about the African States Architectural Project, as so as, um, which led by Prof. Jada Galaha, who's in the audience somewhere. Um, so, oh yeah, there she is. <laughs> um, so each of them, um, so we're a team um, of researchers looking at different um, contexts and different countries and different buildings. And it's in some of the commonali commonalities in what we were seeing that this paper came about. So, and it's really like, of course they arranged the sessions so that everybody has a common theme, but it's really great that it's the same thing's coming out in each of these three um, presentations. Um, and from our perspective with our paper, what we found out is that um, the kind of representations of a kind of African modernity, like the representation of power, representation of the state designed by people who are relatively elite, um, both the architects who are elite in comparison to the rest of the population, but also um, the, the president. So in the case of Malawi, the president takes a, a special interest in this. Um, and it's also a gift from um, China, Taiwan at first, and then changing diplomatic relations becomes a gift from China. Um, in Ghana, it becomes a gift from India. And from the India point of view, it is uh, around this time where um, they're trying to take their place in the world as a global power. Like it's, it's following that rhetoric that they start giving gifts to African countries in the forms of, of, of buildings. Um, and same in, in South Africa, it's, it's, they're trying to, to show that the face of power has changed in this country after apartheid. Um, and we find that the pre preoccupation with infusing symbols thought to be African is a preoccupation of the elite. Um, the kind of ordinary people that we survey and interview around the buildings do not identify or even realize it. Um, so in the Northern Cape legislature, they see a lipstick where the, the elite intend to present a bullhorn. Um, and in Ghana, they, they do see the symbol that is intended, but it's not a symbol that unifies because there's um, over 50 different ethnic groups in Ghana. And then they pick one ethnic group which from independence for some reason has been, and even pre-colonially, this is the group that the British 
relate most to it because they are a martial race, they are an imperialistic, imperialist race, just like um, Great Britain. And then they rely on their symbols as a symbol of that Gold Coast and later Ghana. And other people do not relate to these symbols because they have other symbols of royalty, of power, and of culture. Thank you, Kuku. Uh, I wonder if uh, Pelez is happy to to build up on that. I think the question of the face of power is really interesting, as a, also as a as a turn of as a phrase. Thank you, thank you, Tama. Um, South Africa's communities, they've, I, I believe they've given them much deserved power, especially the protection and the type of entitlement they get to have around the spaces where they live. Um, they kind of determine on the rules of how to live uh, in those um, uh, spaces, um, let alone crime, but there are certain specifics and rules, communal rules in terms of, of, of living. I think that is the social power they continue to have. But also in terms of protests, they continue to make it very well known that they are enfranchisement, the votes. Uh, currently now we are going to go through the local government elections and everyone believe that this is what they have and all they can offer. And it is very important to those who will then take the much bigger power in terms of the state and administration. So these conversations continue through community protests and seem to be very linked to what is known as belonging to the state. Um, in this case, you find that what we've always known, observed um, in, in South African communities when there are protests, they will rather close for operations uh, or, um, but it has never happened that a, a community um, uh, established museum because this is the perception that it is the museum of the area, museum of the people's struggle, museum of um, the current, because within the precinct, there's a digital library, um, which is also on the site. There's also, and the building is standing closed as we speak. So now there's also a, a theater plan. There was a plan for, for a thousand seater theater. And all of these things have never been to where um, African Black people stay. We, we, we have never had museums uh, in townships. We've never had um, libraries, bigger libraries. The digital library was going to be the first of its kind in South Africa um, for that community and the surrounding areas. So that power, and for me, felt that people are saying for us to have and continue to, to, to live um, within this built infrastructure, we also need homes. So in my research, I'm referring to the concept of, of the promise, what promise means to many and how promise then will, when not taken care of, um, lead to unintended consequences, but also I'm, I'm referring to the power of the of the designer, the architect. Um, in in this case, it's Joe Nero. Uh, it's a multi award winning um, infrastructure. Um, and and how and when did he leave the space? Um, when this happened i was also a, a part of the municipal employ, uh, employees i was the head of arts and culture when we opened the museum when the museum was being built i was the one responsible for signing the checks to the the structural engineers and and others but what i found is as very difficult uh, to 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 understand is how the powers as you say were 
used such that a voice or a, a, a conversation and a demand had to be had to be met. And in our discussions, we were saying then when the museum was opened in 2006, um, uh, 2006, was the social maintenance aspect kept up. By social maintenance, did we keep up with the community? Because the community remained Im impoverished in a within a surrounding area of a multi-million um, rent infrastructure. Did we, as the administration at that time, continue to make sure that we pursue both the promise of planning, because it had to start from their homes. So mine was to say, having lived in those corrugated iron houses with wooden floors and the, 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 the what came post 1994 and what the meaning of the infrastructure led to uh, says quite a lot about dynamics um, in the communities we, we, we lived in. And now also looking at um, 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 Kukua's um, unfinished buildings in Mozambique. I've been in Mozamb to, to Mozambique and I've, I've seen this unfinished, but, but could not create a context. I thought these were post, uh, post-war I didn't know these were post-independent um, infrastructure that were not and uh, could not continue um, to be built. The conversation continues, um, but within the profession of architect, uh, mine is to ask then, how do how does the profession begin to plan for the unknown? Um, I mean, we we work on risk, we work on climate change, we work on any but I don't think the social aspect is taken care of by the planners and the designers at all. And it happens, we do have this scenario currently in South Africa. So that's the question I'm still trying to find um, answers from. How do we plan for the unknown, for the crisis, for the unsaid? Thank you. Thank you, Palesa, for both the provocation, which I'm definitely not going to even try to answer <laughs> but uh, also for sharing some of the personal insights in connection to the to the genealogy of the relocation um, project and so over to Patricia and then we can try and open up further in and and unpack a, a couple of points that are emerging okay um, talking about the representation of power that were that you were referring, um, I I think that this um, this uh, Torres Vermelhas complex that I that I have presented, it clearly clearly represents this uh, colonial power. How this um, how in the nineteen seventies how the Portuguese uh, uh, developers um, build uh, or projected a building of twenty five. Uh, floors in this uh, area of the city of low residential um, houses, as we can see in uh, how, as we can um, saw in the in the image that I um, showed, and uh, they they really believe that this um, this building uh, and other buildings um, could represent this. Uh, colonial power, this permanence uh, in Mozambique, while all the, or most of the African continent was gaining, has, had already gained independence uh, by that time. And um, it is funny to, to, to see how this uh, uh, super high building for the highest uh, levels of colonial society, how this was transformed uh, to another uh, people and uh, uh, what it represents now. Um, maybe if, uh, well, we have these uh, two towers and maybe if the, the two towers would uh, belong to the state, maybe the narrative uh, now would be different. But now we have uh, this uh, Bank of Mozambique uh, uh, tower that 
also represents uh, its power, no? uh, the, the, the power of money. <laughs> I don't know how to say. Uh, because uh, we can see the difference just by looking uh, to, to the buildings, you can see the difference uh, in, the, um, in the social classes between the people that lives in the uh, uh, bank of Mozambique Tower and, and the other one. And uh, it still continues, this hour still continues to, to talk about these uh, different uh, uh, faces of power as you said, and uh, this power now has more, uh, it's more related to uh, social economic uh, classes, but, um, but uh, yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it still talks about, about this. Thank you. No, I think it is interesting. I mean, in a sense, we, this conference uh, by and large hasn't really touched upon the economic side of of heritage even sort of uh, let alone of other aspects but i think it would be useful to to make explicit how it has become a commodity and so how by having transformed it into a commodity also that can be taught as a commodity uh, uh, this is complicit with a you know a a further asymmetry and inequality of of both access and, and representation of what is cons constructed as heritage and i think that would be take us also to to other spaces but I, I do want to go back to this question of 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 modern heritage since that's the, the framing of the of the conference of africa in and of itself but i think that the question of power and in terms of also the construction of the nation seem to be modern ideas as well like the nation state as a construct is, is not innocent in in that uh, creating the conditions for which then the architecture of the nation state is designed and i also want to reference that what was said in yesterday's introductory remarks by shadrick Chirikiri, how heritage is a project for the future and so in a sense what is the and I, and I understand palissa's question to architects you know how do architects as a profession and i'd be skeptical to embrace the definition narrowly of the profession but in a sense what is the design what is the project of heritage moving forward in within in in which context and how can that possibly break the nation state as a container and break heritage also as a container and use these hacks that are proposed, for instance, in the work that you're showing from Maputo, that is clearly hacking the structure or uh, in Kukukua's uh, reflection on different forms of representation. Again, are they hacks or you know, how do they inhabit the image in the aesthetics to, to try and, and expand what is then the manifestation. So I don't know if there's anybody in the room who would like to contribute. I mean, I think this these conversations are only rich if they become dialogues rather than monologues. Yes, um, Bayer, you need to put your mic on. You're muted. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. I think that we need to begin to consider a certain view of architecture. When we think of modern heritage, you have in part referred to the fact that I think somebody has expressed it, that maybe heritage is a, is a project of the future. But we must begin to think that architecture, maybe it's empty in itself and society begins to make what it wants of it. But architects, when they make designs in themselves must be open to the idea that it will be read differently at different times in the history of a society. Um, 
the moment that architecture is created, it is related to the powers that create it, whether or not the society reads it, just as the power has read it, it's something that we'll only know in the future. And therefore, when we're thinking of the modern heritage, we must think that even that is subject to a future that is not predictable. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was really interesting and it ties to the point of the promise. I think that uh, Palesa articulated so well. And so who, whose promise, right? And Julia Gallagher. Hi, thank you. Um, I absolutely uh, want to echo the last point and to, to also um, point out how what the three papers interestingly do is think about what happens when people who use buildings or people who live with buildings rather than the people who designed them or commissioned them start to think about what they mean and how that uh, contributes to a, a different kinds of making the buildings but also the things that they represent so in the, the case of of our paper um, when we're talking about buildings which represent the state very sort of iconic representations of the state um, it, it when you start to sort of think about how these users or these observers or these consumers or these citizens uh, think about and talk about these buildings um, they, they make them in different ways, they make them in new ways, and, and it, it shows in a way the, li the limits of the power of the people that commission them, of the elites. Um, and I think it's, it's quite um, interesting how the um, I sort of potentially subversive or destructive ideas have been discussed in relation to these buildings, which show not just an ambivalence about the buildings and potentially ambivalence about the project of modernity or the ways in which it's conceived by elites, certainly, but also in, in I mean, in, in some cases with ambivalence about state power, you mentioned the idea that, of course, um, uh, this sort of, in a way, is sort of representing, as it represents the state, is representing a, a, a an entity which people have problems with. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged by all the papers in the way that they take seriously the perspectives of the non-elites. Thank you. I think it's really um, interesting. There's another raised hand, Rutando. Um, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I just wanted to uh, I was just jumping in, especially into what Julia was saying. Um, I thank you very much to the presenters for very uh, insightful um, presentations. But um, <clears throat> I was just struck again by um, Palissa's uh, point around social maintenance. And it, it just brought um, to mind for me, maybe what we need to do in terms of architecture is how do this, the, the whole notion that she brought forward around the social maintenance of, 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 of the building. So maybe the, 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 what we should be thinking about is how do we um, you know, embed this aspect of, of, of the social life or the social aspects of, of buildings, especially these buildings of uh, you know, government buildings or institutional buildings that um, <clears throat> you know, are driven by the state. Um, because I think, yes, you know, one architecture there's limits to in terms of planning for the unseen, but certainly at the, at the level of design, uh, maybe what we need to start thinking about, um, I mean, I'm also speaking from the perspective of now, uh, a person who, who you know, were, was managing a, a cultural institution or a building that, you know, it has been affected by um, by closure or, or, or you know, um, how do we ensure um, the, these processes of continuous engagement within the communities in which these prisons are located and the people that will use them? How do we embed these processes um, in the life cycle of the building itself? So it, even at the level of time, uh, you know, you have 
these engagements within which these um, disciplines will be located. So for me, um, you, it, it's, it's not enough to say that um, <clears throat> the, you know, the buildings themselves are, are, you know, are, are static beings, you build them and then you know, people must respond and work, uh, uh, work or around them. But it's a question of how do we um, you know, in, in, initiate these processes of engagement so that we, we don't have these situations where you know, buildings are not um, used or are derelict or uh, face closure by the communities in which they're located. So how do, uh, you know, um, as I say, um, embed people in and around the buildings themselves um, from the very beginning and in the life cycle of the buildings? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think this is a, a, an interesting question. I mean, as a as an architect and myself, I, I think sometimes you know one also needs to make explicit the economic cycle that leads to the commission, and you know, so in a sense, that's not um, irrelevant to then where does one's role start or end, or how does one challenge that normative structure if one were to imagine other forms of ownership and appropriation. And, and I think that's what was I found useful in Patricia's um, talk about this point of reappropriation and how does one separate it from, as um, Julia Gallagher uh, mentioned, the question of the elite. Then again, how does one imagine alternative forms of economic distribution so that there's not the risk, as Faleza mentioned, of power being a token, an exchange, and then when vote comes up, then that sets up as as a as a as an exchange mechanism versus what 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 is owned and and what is at, given. I don't want Palesa, you want to speak? Yeah. Thanks. As as we also think about architects, it's people who come in uh, normally not necessarily being part of that community or might have not even done and you know ethnocentric study to to be part of of, of that community uh, therefore rely on on research um I, I'm, I'm saying this because um we we found that over time um that architects are the ones winning the awards the awards are right, written and given in their name, in their honor. Um, so these, these begin to say then, whose building is it um, after all uh, with all of this? Uh, I'm happy um, Nolene Murray, uh, my supervisor is also on board and, and we can further you know, take this on, but the awards are in the name of the architect. And when does the architect leave um, uh, the building or leave the structure? Because they continue to be honored. Thanks. Uh, Nolene, I think you had your hand up. I did. Um, hi, Toma, and uh, hello, everyone. I hope my internet is all right as well. Um, and just to say what a wonderful um, set of papers to all the authors. I think that they've set up such a wonderful framework. And Tom, I think that um, your introduction of the, you know, sort of articulating the, the sort of web of power um, is, is absolutely critical. And I'm reminded, I mean, having sat in heritage discussions for too many years now in South Africa and thinking about, you know, the way in which we speak about power also needs to be spoken about in terms of disciplinary power, you know, and what, um, a whole lot of us sort of did a whole inquiry many years ago into what we call the heritage disciplines. You know, so who's the hand that holds the trial in archaeology? Um, you know, who's who's the how, what is the role of the architect in the sort of you know the the desire to make community, etc. And so I think these papers, you know, the sort of questioning of state architecture, the um, the closure. This, this sort of idea that, um, that there's disciplinary power, I think, is really important as we move um, forward. And so thank. Thank you just to, uh, to everyone for these wonderful presentations. Thank you, Nolene. Um, Harriet McKay, I think I see your hand up. Yes, that's that's me. Hi, everyone. Um, how great to be here with you all. The thing that's been running through my mind, it was 
it's an observation, I guess, as much as anything else. And particularly in what, uh, in response to what Palesa just said, the thing that's been going through my mind is that a question of agency and authorship. And the building that I've had in question th through all of this has been Sites Mocker. Um, partly because it also, um, there's a resonation, there's the, the, the something that resonates there with what you were saying, Toma, about heritage as commodity, which is something that my own paper shortly addresses. Um, so that's in there, but it, it, Zeitz having bought in Heatherwick Studios, and I know there were local architects involved, but as we all know, the, the overarching um, concern was designed by Heatherwick Studios. So something about who's doing the building and who's getting the awards and what kind of local knowledge do they bring to this? Um, or do they, you know? I, it's, as I say, it's an observation, I think, in terms of Zeitz Mocker as being quite a prominent building that um, where the adaptive reuse was conceived of by someone from a very different place. Thanks, uh, Harriet. Um, I know we have maybe three, four more minutes to to try and wrap it up. But I think that the point made on 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 the role of the architect, or where does the architect come from? But again, I think these are these are interesting uh, uh, aspects on which to build. Although I think that one of the ambitions at the very least of, of this particular event and, and process that we've been leading is how to uh, problematize uh, disciplinary and professional silos in a way that uh, rather than referring to them, when one thinks about future of heritage, one starts to imagine alternative ways of co-producing or reflecting or, and I think, all, Ultimately, being a citizen, I think that the, the 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 reality of the point made on modern heritage of Africa, rather than just simply in Africa, is the point of is there can one recognize this this the specificity of of ways of being, and 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 so how do these manifest themselves in in communities and, and I mean when Palesa says you know architects come from outside the community fair enough that but that might be the case and as it has been in many places for a number of reasons that in and of itself is not I find the question is what is the relationships what is the asymmetry of those relationships how how are they established I mean a lot of things uh because communities change and evolve and i think mm -hmm. that's what 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 is interesting in in that sense of recognizing the possibility of of traveling and yesterday there was some mentions of you know the 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 movement and and, and how people move and, and and hence flows of like language things evolve so i think that in that sense i find it it's, it's a it's an enriching process to, to try and 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 sketch out what is the power to imagine that, and uh, and uh, and so partly to reflect on how it is a representation of power, but then how does one imagine alternative forms of power and an organization, I suppose, of, of society? And how does one value that? And I think it is at the end a question of values. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering if there's there's a, a few more questions that are unresolved in by the audience, and otherwise, if we can uh, offer uh, the presenters some last thoughts on 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 how do they see that. Sorry, I had my hand up. I just want to say quickly Sorry. to Alisa's point and also Harriet's um, point as well um, that because um, I've also been thinking about it. So I'm like, I trained as an architect as well. And these are things I'm thinking about. But you see that projects like this, um, if you look at the procurement processes behind it, um, there's a decision to go for a star architect. And when you go for a star architect, then the building is their building, is their authorship, is, is their thing, and they're going to win, win their awards. But it comes back to to why they go for um, for for star architects because there's also like state buildings and things that you cannot find the architect of 
and this I found through my research that they are not recorded. But then there's some that it is all about the architect and maybe even not so, so much about the users and what the building was for. And um, I think it goes, it, it says something about, um, I don't know who said it, but like also like the power of money, the power of capitalism that makes these architects um, the owners and authors of buildings that are more about them than anything else. Thank you. Patricia or Palissa, would you like to add? Yes. Um, well, just um, a few remarks regarding what uh, Utando, I think, and uh, Julia um, said. Um, the perspective of the users, I think it's uh, really important when we talk about this. Um, uh, this heritage, this modern heritage, um, and um, that is why I I I began to to analyze how people are using this space, and um, I think it's important also to 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 hear them, to talk with them. Um, um, I I began to to conduct some interviews why to for my PhD research, and. Um, uh, I realized that there is much more uh, when, um, when, when you hear the stories around the buildings. Uh, for instance, one of my case studies, um, uh, there, there is this um, story about um, how during the post-independence period, uh, there is this uh, ANC, um, because here in, in Mozambique, there were a lot of ANC raids um, uh, and uh, how one of these houses was uh, subjected to some um, to a NC raid, and it has uh, some uh, bullet uh, bullet signs in the house. So it uh, we can uh, understand more about the buildings if we collect all these narratives, because we cannot stop uh, at uh, the beginning and at the project. And we cannot stop uh, at uh, the frozen state now. We can have. We need to understand how these buildings had uh, have um, what they had undergone, and uh, all the stories that are behind this. And uh, maybe with these uh, narratives, maybe we can have this uh, social awareness uh, of this uh, modern heritage. Thank you. It's really uh, uh, an important reminder, and I think, in a sense, also of the of the risk of the ambition of claiming that the narrative is complete, right? Because I think that, or that the historical research is definitive, mm -hmm. and I think that that because things are uh, are so hard to completely capture. I think yesterday we had some uh, questions around the notions of the archive. And so what is the archive on onto which the the research is predicated on and how to make sure that you know it doesn't have glaring omissions and so how does one make sure that this is a living sort of project and and, and, and hence these elements can be captured and and discussed and further enriched and problematized rather than saying it comes to a definitive point uh Palesa, Thank you. Uh, I'm presenting here as a historian and have many recollectives of institutions uh, pertaining to heritage, um, its, its modern aspect and the connotations. I'm, I'm just beginning to reflect on the Rwandan uh, genocide um, memorial site and, and its meaning and its um, intention. When I when I went inside, I could not take pictures from inside. I don't know if people are aware that the skeletons, the real skeletons, the skeletons remain as um, um, artifacts in the museum. They are displayed, and how those exhibitions talk to 
to to to us and saying our I'm so and so I used to love playing soccer and this and that. I I, I just feel that the reflection at this stage and how we we we, we use buildings, we use structures to 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 lead into in this case it's the future of reconciliation. It's the future of social coercion um, that these museums are set and, and, and about, but also how we have um, slowed down in terms of the declaration of these places uh, into world heritage sites in, in, in Africa. There, there's quite a minimal number um, that we have, yet the history is, is, is quite significant. But to the conversation earlier on heritage hubs, I see that they are linked to institutions, one more time, institutions of higher learning. And when we speak of heritage, heritage remains in communities amongst people. I think I'm going to take this further as well as, as a side dis discussions with, with the organizers and yeah. But to say that if, if it's in a university, who's got access? It's the minimal, mum, few, very limited, and those who are having a particular stature in society, and that of being literate, and that of being at a higher level of recognition than others. Um, so if we want to secure this heritage, uh, whether in form of buildings and the lives that we continue to live, um, we might need to, to rethink where it lies and how we, we continue conducting it. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that we, we're finding more discussions in this range and finding each other and talking um, honestly and with sincerity about the difficult questions, um, who owns these buildings? Because even if you go to, um, to the archives, you'll find that the first in line uh, will be the, the, the architects or designers name um, next to the building. And then the people deemed for that, then they don't appear, they are faceless, but they are meant to be. Um, there's some form of co-ownership arrangement that is not as, as, as formal. So changing things in the future and processes um, might lead to us taking care of that. We would not want to see another Timbuktu um, incident and, and many of those, including red location, because for me, um, it reminded me of Timbuktu and I remain sad. Thank you. Thank you, Palissa, um, for this uh, uh, set of final, I mean, final provisional uh, conclusive remarks. And, and I want to also be mindful of the time. Uh, thank again all of the presenters, Kukua, Patricia, Palissa, uh, the others who intervene, and the uh, audience in, in this session. I think it was really uh, valuable and, and, and meaningful. And I will try my best to capture some of the points in reporting later on this afternoon. And uh, and with this, I, I just want to uh, remind you that the, after the break, we will reconvene at uh, 35 past the hour. Um, so with that, uh, thank you again from my side. And uh, also in Philippa's name, well, I'm, I'm afraid I possibly still connected or not, I'm not so sure. Thank you so much. <laughs>